Bruchem Aboyim. Welcome to our home, and again, thank you for attending. So, this week on My Thoughts, I would like to examine the commandment of the Shemitah year, also referred to as the sabbatical year. The Torah commands that every seventh year, those Jews who own fields in the land of Israel must leave their fields fallow for the full year. The land then assumes the status of what we refer to as hefker, ownerless, a term which means that any person or animal can enter your field and partake of any produce that has grown, grown in that field during the Shemitah year. It is a statement that the land does not belong to anyone other than God Almighty himself. We are only a sharecroppers at best. So let us examine the laws of the sabbatical year, seeing that they still apply today for those who live or buy produce that was harvested in the land of Israel on this Shemitah, on this sabbatical year. Now in the third book of the Torah, Leviticus, in the portion of Bahar, the opening verse begins with the Hebrew words that God Almighty spoke to Moshe. It says, Bahar Sinai, on the mountain of Sinai. Rashi, commenting on these words, questions, what connection has the sabbatical year with Mount Sinai? Since at this moment in time, the children of Israel were living in the desert, therefore, the laws of the Shemitah uh, would not apply yet. These laws would not be applicable, basically, until the Jewish nation conquered and divided the land of Canaan, which would not occur until some 54 years in the future. Still, Rashi states that just as the laws regarding a sabbatical year, with all of its generalizations and its details, were stated at Sinai, so too were all the laws of the Torah stated with their generalizations and details at Sinai. The Asnayim the Torah states that usually the Torah doesn't mention the place where a mitzvah was given unless something special happened at that location. So the question is, why is the Shemitah different? Most mitzvahs are kept for a day, a week, maybe even a month. However, for the most part, they are not kept continuously for a whole year. That being the case, the mitzvah of Shemitah is, according to Vayikra Rabbah, one of the most difficult mitzvahs in the whole Torah. Imagine having to go unemployed for an entire year. That is an additional to the fact that one would have to watch helplessly as anyone, anyone had permission to enter your field at will and partake of whatever produce they wanted. That being the case, this commandment was a true test of one's amuna, again, one's belief in God. By keeping this mitzvah, one was in essence testifying that God Almighty and not he is the owner of the earth and all that it produces as it states in Psalm 24 of Tehillim, L'Hashem Ha'aretz Molo, that to God belongs the earth and all of its bounty. The Rebbe asks, why does the Torah use the laws of Shemitah to teach us that all the laws of the Torah were given at Mount Sinai? Why not some other mitzvah? And he answers, again, that the laws of Shemitah would not apply to the nation until they entered the land and conquered it. So it would have been logical to wait and then teach the children of Israel these laws only after they entered the land and divided it. However, if these laws were given to the nation at Sinai, well, then it would be reasonable to assume that all of the laws were also given at Sinai. But still the question remains, why does the Torah discuss the laws of Shemitah and the Yovel, the 50th year also referred to as the Jubilee year in connection with Mount Sinai? So the Svasama states that the whole concept of resting is really against nature. So the fact that the children of Israel were gathered at Mount Sinai meant that they had left the realm of the natural and had now entered into the realm of the angels. This is what the Shabbat signifies, a cessation of work for the holy day. The Shemitah signifies a cessation of work for a full year. After observing seven Shemitahs, the following year, the 50th, the Oval, attaches an additional year to the rest of the Shemitah cycle. All of this was done to teach the children of Israel that their existence in this world 
It is over and above the national order. A realization that Olamazad Doma Le Prusder before Olama Bon, that this world, as it states in Pirkei Avos, is only a vestibule, a hallway, leading to the banquet hall of the world to come. However, since it's impossible for us to totally disconnect ourselves from the natural order of our world, the Shabbat is still connected to the six days of work, and the Shemitah is still connected to the six years of planting and harvesting of the soil. This is in addition to the oval year, the jubilee year, which is still connected to the seven Shemitah cycles. The Nitzvah Velazhin wrote, the principle that we must instill into our psyche is that just as the nation of Israel's survival amongst the nation of the world is miraculous, so too is the survival of the land of Israel unique, different than what is true to all the other lands on this earth. Its viability is not governed by the laws of nature. The land is solely dependent on what we refer to as Hashkocha Pratis, divine providence, which becomes manifest through the observance of God's Torah and his mitzvot. We witness God's divine presence through the blessing that is produced in the land. The blessing that is mentioned in the Torah is that the earth will bring forth a bumper crop in the sixth year. This goes completely against the natural order. The land should naturally be at its weakest point of production after six continuous years of working the land, not the most productive. This then can be viewed as a proof that the Torah was given to us by God Almighty, the creator of the world, since no human being would be foolish enough to make a statement as fact that would easily be proven false. So though it would seem that the observance of the Shabbat, pardon me, Shabbat day and the Shemitah year would diminish rather than add to one's wealth, God Almighty promises that anyone who observes, the, observes these mitzvot will be blessed. The Talior states a man must never allow his preoccupation with making money to become the driving force in their life. Once they have successfully passed the test of the Shemitah, then they can truly enjoy the bounty of the next six years, doing so with the knowledge that their wealth is not the results of their own abilities. Rather, it is a blessing bestowed upon us from a benevolent Father in Heaven. The Rashba asks, Why were the children of Israel driven into exile? for not observing the laws of the Torah. After all, they could have claimed that they were originally coerced into accepting the Torah. We know the Medrash tells us that at the giving of the Torah on Mount Sinai, that God Almighty held the mountain over their head, heads of the nation like a barrel, and he said to them, either accept the Torah or here you will die. The commentaries tell us that God gifted the children of Israel the land of Israel, only on the condition that they observe all the laws of the Torah. And well, that being the case, if they did not keep the Torah, well, then they had no right to inhabit the land. The claim that they were coerced uh, is only applicable to fulfilling the mitzvahs that are what we refer to as chovat haguf, those that are connected to their bodies. But those mitzvot that are chovat ha'aretz, connected to the land, well, are in a separate category completely. That being the case, the claim of coercion cannot be used. After all, since the land itself demands observance, that is what the term Har Sinai, the mountain of Sinai, signifies. That the land itself demands that the children of Israel keep the Shemitah year. If they do not, well, then the land itself demands that they must be exiled. So the first exile of the children of Israel from the land lasted for a period of 70 years. These 70 years were decreed upon the people so as to compensate the land for the 70 Shemitah cycles which the children of Israel failed to observe. The nation of Israel resided in the land for a total of 850 years before they were driven into exile. If they had neglected to observe 70 Shemitah cycles, over that 850-year period before the exile, well, that would have meant 
that for the first 360 years, they actually did observe the Shemitah year. Then for the following 490 years, they stopped. But the question we have to ask is, why? What changed? Somehow for the first 360 years, the nation witnessed that God Almighty kept his promise and that the land produce in the sixth year enough bounty to last into the eighth year. And in addition, that in the oval year, that there, would, there was enough produce to last even into the ninth year. After this initial period of 360 years, did God no longer keep his promise? The truth is, in reality, nothing changed. The blessing stated in the Torah connected with the Shemitah is, V'achalta v'savata, and you will eat and you'll be saved. The blessing was not that they would necessarily have an overabundance of produce. The blessing was that they would have enough to be sated, sated, not stuffed. Just like with the Shabbat, if one doesn't prepare on Friday, then they will not have what to eat on the holy day of rest. For a person who lacks a muna, faith, having only enough is seen as a deficiency. In a Rosisha, one saw Eliyahu and Nabi. Elijah the prophet. And he asked him, why is it that when one questions God in the portion of Bahar and asks, man nochal b'shona hashvias, what will we eat in the seventh year? That God answers in the following verse, that I will command my blessing on you in the sixth year. Well, this would seem to indicate that if one has perfect faith and doesn't wonder or doesn't ask about the seventh year, that they do not receive a blessing. So Eliyahu Anubi answered Reb Zushin, that the individual that asks the question needs a special blessing since they have shown a lack of faith. However, the individual who has perfect faith, well, their blessing is continuous. They therefore have no need for any other blessing since the flow of their original blessing was never interrupted by any doubts based on the Torah's elbows. Rabbeinu Bachai states that the Shemitah year teaches us that even during the six years when we treat the land as if it is ours, in reality, we come to the realization that it is only a gift from a benevolent father. Now, according to Benita Militaira, the Shemitah year is more than a mitzvah. It is a testimonial to the Creator which signifies the holiness of the land of Israel. At the same time, it imbues within us a compassion for our fellow man who suffers even during the six years of planting and harvesting. And it's interesting that with both the Shabbat and the Shemitah, the Torah mentions both work and rest. Why is it that in connection with the Shabbat, first it mentions rest and only then the six days of work? However, with the Shemitah, the Torah reverses the order and mentions first the six years of work, and only then does it mention rest. Now the sanctity of the Shabbat comes by itself, whereas the sanctity of the Shemitah year depends upon the work of the preceding years. This fits well with what the Rambam states, Maimonides, that the purpose of the Shemitah year is that the land should have a rest after six long years of work so that its productivity will increase. He also stresses the benefits of the Shemitah year and the Oval to the community. It serves as a method by which to preserve family ownership over one's property, in addition to benefiting and supporting the poor and destitute, all of which add to the improvement of economic conditions shared by all of the nation. All of this is attained by the increased productivity of the land. What is the similarity between the Shabbat and the Shemitah? After all, both exist through the established order of nature. But the Yom Tovim and the Oval come through the designation of man. The Yom Tovim through the sanctification of the Jewish court, which establishes the new month through the testimony of witnesses. Reb Chaim Vital says that the Shemitah year is to remind us of the creation of the world that God Almighty created this world in six days, and that on the seventh day, he rested. The Zohar states that the six days of the week are blessed by one keeping the Shabbat, and so too the six years of planting and reaping are blessed 
but one keep in the seventh year, the Shemitah. In Ma'am Lois, it states that the word Shemitah means to withdraw. The command is that one must withdraw from their field and let it rest for the whole year. One must treat the field as if it's, it's not theirs. The commandment comes to teach the rich man just how much grief the poor man has to endure daily, each and every day of his life. Now the gematria, the numerical value of the Hebrew word Shemitah, is 364, which is the same gematria, the same numerical value as the Hebrew word Sutton, Satan. This is an allusion to the fact that the Sutton tries to interfere with the Jew observing the Shemitah all 364 days of the seventh year. Yom Kippur is his only day off, again, based on a base Mordechai. Also, the Toast Torah mentions the mitzvot of Shemitah and Yovel in the portion of Bahar, in the third book of the Torah in Leviticus. If you count the number of verses in the portion of Bahar, there are a total of 57 verses. 57 is the gematria, the numerical value of the Hebrew word zon, which means sustenance. Through the observance of the 50th year of the Oval, in addition to the 7th year of the Shemitah, which when added together, 50 and 7, 57, is an allusion to the fact that by observing both of these mitzvot, the land will give forth its zon, its sustenance, again based on a base Mordechai. Now, the laws of the Shemitah year are still observed in the land of Israel today, since the only requirement needed to observe this mitzvah is that at least one Jew lives in the land. However, the requirement to observe the laws of the Yovel year, the sabbatical year, pardon me, the Jubilee year, are only observed when all the Jews live together in the land. May God Almighty bless us with the coming Mashiach Sikhanim, and may he come quickly and in our time so that we can all fulfill the mitzvah of the Yovel again, once again. And thank you very much for attending. Uh, and God should bless you with only good. Again, this week will be Shavuot, the giving of the Torah. Again, God should bless you that you should be able to receive the Torah in good health and with joy. And uh, again, it should usher in again the coming of the Mashiach. Again, we've waited long enough. The I'm hoping that next week, um, after Shavuos, again, when it's time to, we can listen to music again, that we will, I will begin a series of original songs that I've uh, recorded and uh, arranged, and hopefully you'll find that enjoyable and informative. Again, most of the songs that I've written are on verses in prayer, again, which goes back many times to Tehillim, to, to the Psalms of King David. Again, let me bless you again with a good Shabbat. Uh, with a happy uh, Chag Sameach, happy holiday, and again, with all that is good. Thank you very much for attending. God bless and be well. Have a good night.